Hello everyone, and welcome back to History 1152. In this lecture video, we will be discussing life in the United States after the First World War from about 1918 to 1929. We'll talk about some important events and political and social developments during this period, along with a consideration of what these trends meant for everyday people during these years. Let's start by going back to 1918. The U.S. did not have significant numbers of boots on the ground in Europe until early 1918, so at best, most American soldiers saw less than one year of combat in Europe during the First World War. During this brief period, however, over 50,000 soldiers died. And after the war ended on November 11, 1918, Americans were ready for things to go back to the way they were before the war. They, like people all across the world, wanted to return to what was called normalcy. The desire for normalcy was brought on by the massive social changes that had come as a result of the war. The mobilization of the civilian populace, the massive loss of life as a result of war deaths, and additionally, many returning veterans suffered from acute physical wounds. Many had lost appendages, limbs, or the ability to see or hear. Still others had endured psychological trauma that would stay with them for the rest of their lives, what was called shell shock in the contemporary parlance. But some people today would call it post-traumatic stress disorder. Many of these increasingly common wounds and disorders came about as a result of new military technologies, especially those related to artillery and poison gas. In previous wars, diseases had by far been the greatest killer, but in World War I, up to two-thirds of the casualties were battlefield deaths and fatalities. Within battlefield casualties, most wounds, up to 70%, were caused by artillery rather than small arms, a departure from previous wars. Ultimately, the social and technological changes that came about as a result of World War I left people, Americans included, longing for pre-war days. Before things could turn back to normal, however, a new challenge emerged that threatened to be even deadlier than the war, Spanish influenza. This disease, H1N1 influenza A, probably did not start in Spain, but the Spanish were first to document cases of the illness because the Spanish media had not been censored since Spain had remained neutral during the First World War. Epidemiologists to this day still debate where the virus originated. Some think the virus may have first made human contact in China, since China had experienced less lethal flu season in 1918, as the rest of the world suffered from the so-called Spanish influenza, suggesting Chinese people had gained herd immunity because the disease first jumped species in China. More commonly, epidemiologists think that the Spanish flu spread to humans in Europe as a result of the fighting of the First World War. Soldiers lived in crowded trenches and were unable to observe proper hygiene practices. Animals that commonly carry influenza viruses, swine and fowl, lived and were slaughtered and processed close to the battlefronts. While there is some discussion over how the Spanish flu spread to humans, there is no debate that once the flu jumped species, it spread very quickly. It was more lethal than typical seasonal flus. Flu typically is most lethal to people who are very young, very old, or already sick with another disease, but the Spanish flu seemed to kill young people in great numbers. Veterans who had survived the trenches of Europe fell to the flu in great numbers because many of them were still living in crowded barracks in Europe, waiting to be shipped home. Between 1918, 1919, and 1920, Spanish influenza infected at least 500 million people and between 17 and 50 million people across the world died from the Spanish flu. Some epidemiologists think the flu might have killed as many as 100 million people. In the worst hit areas, cemeteries filled, and the dead had to be buried in mass graves. Governments fought the disease by quarantining the sick and by encouraging asymptomatic and healthy people to wear masks, in much the same way that contemporary governments have tried to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The 1919 wave of Spanish flu hit the U.S. especially hard, 
affecting New York City, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, St. Louis, and Memphis, Tennessee, with there being tens of thousands of deaths. A final wave of the disease emerged in 1920, but few died, most likely because herd immunity had been established across the world. No functional vaccine was created during the pandemic. Reliable flu vaccines were not going to be developed until the 1940s. Some epidemiologists have theorized that the Spanish flu died out in 1920 because an asymptomatic strain of the virus emerged, which could have spread to people, giving them immunity without making them sick. The Spanish flu pandemic came on the heels of the First World War and just made Americans long for normalcy and a return to pre-war days even more. How did Americans deal with the trauma of World War I and the Spanish flu? In some ways, they tried to turn back time. They rejected many of the policies that had been championed by progressive era politicians. Although women gained suffrage in 1920, an important progressive policy, Americans rebelled against progressivism, including President Wilson's League of Nations, a precursor to the UN, which the US government refused to join. Instead of abiding by the 18th Amendment, the Volstead Act of 1919, which banned alcohol and was inspired by wartime alcohol prohibition, Americans found ways to drink illegally in the years after the war. Americans in rural areas made their own moonshine, illicit liquor that was distilled and often transported at night under the light of the moon. Americans had been making illegal whiskey for centuries, hiding their spirits from tax collectors, but national prohibition made illicit liquor con production a big business. American alcohol distributors who could not produce their own liquor would smuggle it in from Canada or Mexico. Americans in Southeast Florida would smuggle liquor in from the Bahamas and Cuba. Smuggling alcohol, called bootlegging, also became a big business. Where did Americans drink these illegal alcoholic beverages? While some Americans drank at home, many also preferred to drink at speakeasies, illegal underground bars and saloons that were either concealed from law enforcement or these establishments would pay off the police so they could operate in the open. Unsurprisingly, there was a massive rise in organized crime in the United States as criminal gangs took over the nation's breweries and distilleries and operated speakeasies. Many of the gangs were founded by immigrants or first-generation Americans who took advantage of the poverty in which new immigrants lived, giving them little recourse but to engage in illegal activity in order to survive. Other illegal activities took place in speakeasies, including illicit gambling, prostitution, and drug use. Proponents of prohibition argued that making alcohol illegal was good for society because it lowered the rate of alcohol-related diseases like liver cirrhosis, and infant mortality also decreased during Prohibition. Proponents of Prohibition argued that alcohol bans could also cause a decrease in domestic violence, although Prohibition's impact on these crimes has been disputed. Critics of Prohibition argued that the criminalization of alcohol had, and the forcing of Christian social gospel ideals that were more popular in rural areas on the nation as a whole caused a rise in organized crime as a result of alcohol being made illegal. In addition, proponents of ending prohibition argued that the alcohol industry provided a massive tax base for the U.S. government and moving it into the black market denied the country of important tax revenue. This was the argument made by leading business magnate John D. Rockefeller, a strong Christian and a non-drinker, who nonetheless called for an end to prohibition. Both proponents and critics of prohibition also made xenophobic arguments to defend their perspective. Proponents argued that immigrants drank too much and that prohibition was necessary to make poor and struggling immigrants assimilate into American culture. Critics point out the, and exaggerated the role that immigrants and first-gen Americans played in the criminal gangs that had arisen to sell alcohol. Let's talk about some of the people that took part in the underground alcohol industry. Alphonse Gabriel Capone, the most notorious criminal gangster of the 1920s, was born in New York City to Italian immigrant parents. 
Al Capone grew up poor, living in a five-point slum, and quickly joined a gang. Capone moved to Chicago in 1920 and worked as a bodyguard for Johnny Torrio, an Italian immigrant and head of the Chicago outfit. After nearly being killed by a rival gang, Torrio retired and gave control of the Chicago outfit to Capone. Capone expanded the Chicago outfit's bootlegging and used the money he made to pay off the police and the mayor of Chicago to keep them from closing the gang's speakeasies or attempting to stop their other illegal activities. Capone was able to operate in the open, but over time, the methods he and his enforcers used against their competition became more violent, culminating in the St. Valentine's Day va Massacre of February 14, 1929. Capone's men went into a building that was owned by William Bugs Moran, a rival gang kingpin who was himself a son of French and Canadian immigrants. Capone's thugs, disguised as police officers, lined Moran's men against the wall and shot them with Thompson submachine guns and shotguns, killing seven. The grisly, execution-style murder caused public outcry and led to Capone being labeled public enemy number one. Under pressure from the American people, federal prosecutors looked to get Capone off the streets and were ultimately not able to jail him until 1931, and then only for the crime of tax invasion. Capone only served five years before being released due to his rapidly declining physical and mental health. The rise in xenophobia in the United States also coincided with the rise in the belief in eugenics. Eugenics, a policy that was designed to encourage the improvement of humanity through the control of human reproduction, had previously been part of the Progressive Era agenda. It became even more popular in the 1920s, even as other progressive poli policies fell out of favor, because many white Americans were concerned about how immigration and African-American migration within the U.S. would affect the nation's racial and ethnic demographics. In response, the U.S. government passed a series of immigration quotas that limited the number of people that could come to the U.S., especially from non-white countries. While xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment were often common and came into the debate over prohibition and organized crime, anti-immigrant sentiment was even more salient in the trial of Niccolo Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Sacco and Vanzetti were immigrants from Italy and were members of an anarchist gang. The gang they were a part of, led by Luigi Galliani, planned to assassinate American politicians, especially those who had deported immigrant radicals. They hoped that the assassinations would spark an anarchist revolution in the United States. Some anarchists hoped to transform the United States into a communist republic of the Soviet Union, believing that anarchism would be a stepping stone to communism, while others simply wanted to destroy the American government. In the wake of World War I and the Russian Revolution, Americans were becoming increasingly worried about immigrants, especially those who held anarchist and or communist beliefs, leading to a Red Scare. This anxiety about the spread of communism inspired President Wilson to send troops to Vladivostok on Soviet Russia's eastern coast from 1918 to 1920. Sacco and Vanzetti certainly fit the foreign red menace stereotype. In 1919, four anarchists that were allied with Sacco and Vanzetti were killed in Massachusetts when a bomb they were making exploded. Then, in 1920, a paymaster and a security guard, who was, by the way, of Italian descent, were murdered during an armed robbery at a factory that was also in the Bay State. Sacco and Vanzetti were arrested after trying to flee the police. They were brought up on the charge of murder, convicted, and sentenced to death. In response to their conviction, anarchists and revolutionaries protested and planned reprisals, believing that Sacco and Vanzetti had been unfairly convicted. Vanzetti himself commented that the jury was biased against immigrants and anarchists, and that this prejudice was why he was found guilty. They appealed the case, but were once again found guilty.
Many legal experts who observed the case argue that the evidence on which the jury convicted Sacco and Vanzetti was not sufficient to prove their guilt, particularly the ballistics tests that were used to match the bullets that killed the guard and the paint master may not have matched those fired by guns owned by Sacco and Vanzetti. The appeals failed and Sacco and Vanzetti were executed by the electric chair in 1927. Subsequent inquiries into the case have explored how ethnic prejudice impacted the decision-making of the jury, but historians have concluded that Sacco and Vanzetti's political beliefs had a greater impact on the jury's decision as opposed to their ethnic status or immigration status. Additionally, more advanced ballistic tests completed in the 1960s indicated the bullets that killed the guard and paymaster had been fired from Sacco's gun. Ultimately, many experts think that prejudice probably did not play as big of a role in the jury's decision to convict Sacco and Vanzetti, as much as contemporary observers claimed, although many still think they were wrongly convicted because the jury did not have enough evidence at the time to ascertain their guilt. This led Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis to apologize for Sacco and Vanzetti's con convictions in 1977. He did not pardon them or declare them innocent, but instead argued that evidence strong enough to convict them had not been found until after their executions, violating American legal jurisprudence. Although many Americans rebelled against progressive agendas by engaging in organized crime, anarchist terrorism, or ethnic prejudice, most Americans in the 1920s just wanted to have their lives, forget about the Great War, get rich and have a good time. This attitude created what later observers called the Roaring Twenties. People drank alcohol and danced at speakeasies while listening to jazz music, which was often performed by African-American musicians and was a mixture of classical music and African-American styles like the blues and ragtime. African-Americans also began moving to cities in larger numbers during the First World War, and this trend would continue into the 1920s, prompting black cultural movements like the Harlem Renaissance in New York City. American sense of morality changed during the 1920s as premarital sex became less taboo and more common than it had been before the war. Gender roles also changed in the 1920s as well. Women gained the right to vote, although African-American women, like black men, were still largely barred from voting in the South. More women had entered the workforce during World War I, and many had taken jobs traditionally done by men, such as truck driving and heavy industrial labor, so that more men could fight. More women also worked in factories to make munitions, although women had been making work in factories since the early 19th century. As values changed, fashion changed to reflect American culture's new beliefs. Men began to dress more casually, although their clothing would still be considered formal by contemporary standards. Women's fashion, though, changed far more significantly. In many ways, women's fashion, as a result of the social changes, became more androgynous, as women cut their hair into short bob-style cuts, and they stopped wearing tight, waist-constricting corsets that had been popular from the 1800s to the 1910s, reflecting how women had begun to enter male spheres and take up physical activities traditionally done by men. Women also began to exercise more, with the hope of developing slender, boyish figures in comparison with the more curvy, hourglass body type that was considered attractive at the turn of the century. In other ways, though, women also sought to show off their femininity in 1920s styles. They began to wear more makeup, and their clothing and jewelry also became flashier, especially compared to the drab styles that had been popular during World War I. Women's skirts, to complement their hair, also became shorter, going only to the knees. Some women who wanted to show off this daring new, about-the-knee style would even apply red makeup to their knees. Women who adopted these novel styles, along with new attitudes and pastimes, were called flappers, to note their loose way of living, although the term had been used for young women since the early 1900s. Actresses Louise Brooks and Clara Bow offer a good example of the flapper style and attitude. In 
Terms like flapper became popularized slang among young people who came up with new phrases and terms to describe their feelings and differentiate themselves from the older generations. They called things they liked the cat's meow, the bee's knees, or jazz. They also developed slang terms like going to man to see a man about a dog or petting to describe illegal or taboo activities like buying alcohol or sexual acts. While many Americans celebrated the social changes of the 1920s, others were more pessimistic, like F. Scott Fitzgerald, whose novel, The Great Gatsby, showed the dark side of the 1920s jazz age lifestyle. While values were changing in America, especially in cities, Americans in rural areas often tried to push back against the social change that was occurring in their nation. Henry Ford, the engineer and industrial magnate, developed inexpensive mass-produced automobiles like the Model T using assembly line technology. Ford intended to use cars to help rural people have easier lives so they wouldn't have to move to the cities and be corrupted by their influence, which after 1920 had overtaken rural areas in terms of population. The problem was that cheaper automobiles meant the hedonistic culture of the cities which Ford detested could spread more easily to rural areas, so his plan essentially had the opposite effect of what he intended. Media technologies, like radio and film, also brought urban culture, especially in the form of jazz music and movies, to rural areas. Another example of the growing divide between rural and urban culture could be seen in the summer of 1925 in Tennessee. In the small town of Dayton, a science teacher named John Scopes was put on trial, allegedly for teaching evolution in a local public school, which violated the 1924 law that forbade the teaching of evolution in Tennessee in public schools. Scopes had never actually taught evolution, but he and his supporters hoped to use the trial as a test case that would lead to the overturning of laws forbidding the teaching of Darwin's work. The case became a cultural firestorm between Christian fundamentalists and conservatives who opposed the teaching of evolution, believing that it would violate their religious beliefs and corrupt society, and modernists who wanted to secularize education. The former populist presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan spoke for the prosecution, and Clarence Darrow defended Scopes. Ultimately, Scopes was convicted and sentenced to pay a $100 fine. But the modernists had actually succeeded in their goals by drawing attention to Tennessee's law against the teaching of evolution in the schools. Clarence Darrow, the lawyer for the defense, also succeeded in making Bryan and the fundamentalists look foolish and backward in the eyes of the public. While some Americans thought that laws or technology were the best way to prevent social change in the 1920s, others turned to more violent means. The Ku Klux Klan, which had been refounded in 1915, largely as a result of D.W. Griffith's film, Birth of a Nation, which portrayed Klansmen saving whites from dangerous black people in the South, caused membership in the KKK to increase throughout the 1910s and early 1920s, as the hate group expanded its range targeting immigrants, Jews, and Catholics, adding them to its list of enemies. The original Klan, which had been a southern organization, grew to become national, having branches throughout the Northeast, West, and Midwest, especially Indiana. Racial prejudice against black people was on the rise in some parts of the North, especially in cities like Chicago. Chicago, whose African-American population increased significantly during the Great Mar Migration, was the site of a massive race riot in the summer of 1919 in which 23 blacks and 15 whites were killed, and hundreds of African-American homes were destroyed by arson. The riot took place because of racial prejudice, but it also took place on the backdrop of labor issues, as many of the black workers who had migrated to Chicago had taken jobs vacated by whites who had left to fight in the war. The Klan also preyed on Anglo-Americans' anxieties about immigration, organized crime, and changing moral values by promising to reinstate Protestant Christian values. 
Although main, no mainstream Protestant denomination endorsed the organization, and many outright condemned it. The second clan was less violent than the first clan, or later iterations of the hate group, preferring to instead lead marches and protests. But its leaders still committed violent acts, including lynching, especially in the South. The clan had membership of people from all political parties, but it still had many ties to the Democratic Party, especially in the South. The Klan even marched at the New York City Democratic Party Presidential Convention in 1924, dividing the party over whether to support or condemn the organization. By 1926, however, the Klan had severely weakened, largely due to the trial of D.C. Stevenson, an Indiana Grand Dragon who was convicted of kidnapping, rape, and second-degree murder of a woman in a Hoosier state. The trial made national news, casting Stevenson, who had promised to defend white Protestant womanhood as a hypocrite and a purveyor of the very same vices that the Klan had promised to stop. Stevenson was sentenced to life imprisonment, and once incarcerated, he released a list of Indiana politicians that were on the KKK payroll. The Stevenson case severely damaged the Klan's reputation in the eyes of the American Republic making the organization look like it was spreading the very moral corruption that it had pledged to destroy. But the xenophobic and racist attitudes that the Klan had stoked would remain after it had fallen from grace. The Roaring Twenties came to a crashing end in the fall of 1929, when the New York Stock Exchange and Dow entered a bear market phase, and a recession that would come to be known as the Great Depression began. About $30 billion of wealth, $450 billion in today's dollars, and about the same amount the country had spent on World War I was lost as the price of stocks plummeted. People at the time debated what initiated the crash. Some argued that greed and corruption had caused the stock drop, pointing to the scandals like Teapot Dome, in which people inside the administration of Republican President Warren J. Harding had leased drilling rights at a U.S. Navy oil reserve to private companies. Others posited that it was too much debt that caused the crash and that too many Americans invested in the market on credit, causing a panic. Still, others believed that the nation's financial institutions were to blame, especially as banks failed and Americans were unable to withdraw their savings. While historians and economists still debate the causes of the stock market crash of 1929 and the ensuing Great Depression, they agree that the crash severely damaged the confidence of many Americans, bringing an end to the expansive economic growth and optimism of the Roaring Twenties. Americans from all backgrounds would be focused much more on economic survival than they would be on having fun or returning to a post-World War I world in the decades that followed the 1920s. We'll talk about the Great Depression in the next video.